Okay, so this lecture is about fighting trenches, and there's so much to say here, uh, and so what I'll do is I'll give a quick overview of siting considerations, quickly review mapping, because we already discussed this in our exercise period last week, and then I'll give some examples, mostly from my own experience, and so they're not complete, but uh, it's, I've kind of tried to, as I'm showing the examples, point out the considerations that we made for why we put the trends there in our strategy. Because I know there were some questions. I know, Suchi, you were asking, so what do we do? Where do we dig? So here's some, you know, examples. And again, uh, many of the figures come from the Pillow Seismology book, if they're not from my own group research. So the, the main purposes for digging a Pillow Seismic Trench, there's two. One is to determine the displacement from the subsurface dislocation of materials. And so usually then you want to have a narrow strand because we want to know displacement. So we want to know across the narrow zone and what was the offset. If you have a wide zone, it can be difficult to interpret because you have to add up the displacement on all the strands to get the total. The second purpose is for recurrence. And so in this case, we're looking for changes in the topography due to earthquakes that then are buried. And so in this case, it's often better to have a wide zone because there will be many examples of ground deformation that are preserved. So these two sometimes go against each other. It is difficult to do both displacement and timing at the same location. And so you have to consider, when you choose a site, the diversity of the sedimentary units. You want to be able to see the layers uh, almost like different colors so that we can see the break. And we want to hope that at least some of the sedimentary units have datable material. The other thing we have to be careful for is in many places, the soil development and bioturbation can destroy the stratigraphy that we're interested in. So you need to read the geomorphology to see, okay, this is a place that has had less bioturbation. Often it means it's some steady sedimentation that keeps the animals away or keeps the vegetation lower. But we don't want erosion. And then the other thing is depth of target relationships. Do you, if you have too high of a sedimentation rate, you'll bury the earthquakes and you may only see the last one or nothing. So these are things in general consideration. So this is a complex diagram from the McAlpin book, but he shows a complete flowchart for siting. And the main thing is up here at the top is mapping. As I said, you have to map first. And then it comes down in this middle series of breaks is, is this fault scarf or from a fault or is it from human caused features like as I said yesterday here there's so much agriculture that you have to be careful you're not looking at an old agricultural feature so then you, you say okay yes it is something we want to target so we do the site study and trenching so you may identify paleo potential sites with detailed mapping but you see also they show geophysical surveys so this is what we just were talking about and then the final aspect of the fighting is the layout. So how are we going to cut the ground? And then you interpret the results. So in this lecture, I'm really only talking about the approach up into once the trench is cut in a few lectures, I think the day after tomorrow, then we start, okay, what do we see when we're in the trench? So I'm not going to go all the way through the whole story each time. Maybe if you have a, a, a one of these sites, a displacement site, and we can get displacement, and if we associate with a single earthquake, then if you can decide if it's a maximum displacement or an average displacement, you can use the empirical moment approach from Wells and Coppersmith. So you can say, well, we see that it's a one meter offset, so it must be 97 or something. If it's a huge earthquake and offset five meter, this would be indicated. If it's small cracking, then it must be magnitude So it's difficult from a single site to determine the magnitude because you don't know if you're in the middle of a big earthquake or if you're on the, the tail of it. Well, if you're in the middle of a small earthquake or on the tail of a big one, it has the same offset. So multiple sites are best for the magnitude interpretation. So just an example of mapping, this is actually for an earthquake study, but uh, a, from the McAlpin book, he's showing uh, just using a GPS. So he just sets his GPS up 
and he has like a piece of paper with a grid, and so these are UTM positions, and so he's walking with his paper, and he's saying, okay, I'm here, okay, I can see this crack coming along, and uh, take some pictures, measure some scar pipe, mapping, you know, delineating the a few other features like the scrubland means the some small plants, and then transition from this more strike slip portion of the earthquake to a little bedrock ridge, and so on. So it's, um, I think the point of this map is that you don't always have to have a, uh, always a complete geologic and geomorphic map, but sometimes you can even just map the critical features around the site, and then this would guide a trenching study. So here, you know, for a for a displacement trench, we may cut across this area here. This is a simple uh, part of the fault zone. Here there's two cracks and probably some vertical deformations, so this might be a better place for an earthquake timing trench. And then in here we're starting to get to the edge of this strike slip zone, so this might not be as good of a place to dig a trench uh, because it's more complicated. Um, so, always mapping before trenching. This particular example is from this uh, January 2001 earthquake that in, um, I think it's called the Bhuj earthquake, if you remember in India, southwest India. And so they call it the, the public date earthquake, but it was the Bhuj. So I already talked about this the other day in our uh, mapping activity, so I won't go into too much detail, but we always have our remote sensing tools. We may use this approach. I think it's really valuable to do the morphologic or other mapping along the fault zone systematically so we can really justify the choice of the fault locations. And then also, by looking, understanding the process map, we can then anticipate what we'll see in the trench in terms of stratigraphy and material type. So here, for example, is the nice fault map from the Japanese with then, uh, you know, their trench site, for example, right here for context. And then if you remember this uh, photo of the place, they dug a trench across this young alluvial fan. So their idea was probably, you know, this blue fan is an older one. So trenching across that may not give us the timing of the last earthquake, but it's better for slip rate study because there's this 15, this, this offset right here at the edge. But here they could go do some detailed work to maybe look at the disruption of the young sediments in the young fan surface here to uh, determine the timing of the last few earthquakes. So then they present with uh, stereo imagery for the context. So just as an example of the kinds of, uh, you know, these are, are fault scarps that are indicative of young, earth, young earthquakes or high slip rates. And so you see, you know, this normal fault scarp, different sh characteristics. Here, remember you're asking about the wine glass. These would be the wine glass valleys right here. And so they're more commonly seen on this normal faulting case. Here's the reverse fault. Uh, so, so somewhere between, because if we think of Lenbong, it's this very steep fault, but, you know, either reverse or normal. So it's going to be somewhere in its character, maybe in between these three. But, with higher erosion rates, so we don't see such a nice sharp scarp. And then here's some crushed zone, strikes of faulting, and so on. So just uh, one thing that sometimes can be useful is to build these nice cartoon models of the geomorphology of the fault zone to help explain what you're seeing in place. So this could be a good thing, especially after our work yesterday to do for Lenbaum fault, what do we see? And then this is the the kind of feature that or uh, symbology for mapping for the interpretations. Remember yesterday I was so strong you have to do the 
observations and the morphology first, but then once you make the interpretations of the fault traces, you can use some of this kind of uh, graphical description to, to show maybe what you interpreted there. So here, for example, we did uh, Limbong yesterday, and we're going from this overview to focus study. So here is Parampong uh, site, and remember we were we were just looking here, and I said, well, one of you we could come down and just try to dig some trenches on the side of the the active river, so that there would be maybe this diversity of sediment. Because if you recall Echo, he said, oh well. You know, we trenched in a site like this, where it's only colluvium coming off the fault scarp. And he said it was impossible to interpret because it was the the tuff is eroding and being deposited with colluvium, and it was very difficult to tell the difference between the original weather tuff and the colluvium from the weather tuff. There's no diversity of stratigraphy. So I was thinking, well, one of you could go down here. And as long as there wasn't too much lateral erosion, removing the records to find a small pocket where there'd be a mixture of colluvium and fluvial sediment. So that's an idea. And if we have uh, lots of energy and money, we can go and test. And one theme I will say that I think the general point is you have to always allow for some failure. Like you can dig and you say, okay, there's nothing here. We can't do it. But then you dig another one because sometimes you dig one and you say, okay, we can't we can't interpret. I guess trenching doesn't work. You know, but you have to try again and try again. And after a while, you say, okay, now we can relate the geomorphology to the trench site and where the best ones are. So that's why it's important to plan for multiple trenches because you may only be successful after a few tries. And and so in many cases. For example, I have some colleagues in Switzerland, and they they are really afraid to trench because they think they only will be allowed to do one trench. And if they don't get it right the first time, then the government's going to say, well, see, trenching doesn't work. We're not going to do it anymore. And so they don't want to even start because they want to be confident. But I keep saying, oh, you have to convince them. Just try and try. So this is a kind of philosophical point. So... Let's talk about just some um, places and, and how do we make the trenches. So one thing is with the shovel. Okay. This is, uh, in some ways easy because you can usually find your friends or hire some people and you say, let's start digging, guys. And, uh, it's amazing how much people can dig. This was dug in one day with, uh, these people, six, six seven people, but digging in, with three shovels you know, all the time for 12 hours. <laughs> so, uh, but if, if you can, or if you can and you have the money, you can get the machinery, right? So there's different kinds of excavation tools. And I think it's a little bit funny. This is actually from McAlpin himself. He's showing us about our pillow seismology tools and their characteristics. So increasing from, you know, what we call back hole. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a tractor with rubber tires and a arm. Usually these aren't quite so strong, but they're cheaper and, and you can maybe find them in many places. So they usually can only go four meters or so deep. You're lucky to have a one meter wide trench. So then you go bigger. The, the excavators or track holes are really quite nice. Uh, usually also can be commonly found they're really powerful, like they, boulders almost, they don't get stopped by anything. And they can dig deep in some cases. 11, this is a little bit high, but for sure six meters. And sometimes a wide bucket. And then you can do then even bigger machines, like, uh, this is a, uh, a loader and into, uh, bulldozing. So these are, you know, uh, I think, one other lesson is that often we are too shy. You know, we just dig a tiny little trench, but maybe we need to dig a big one. And so McAlpin, he is well, he's famous for doing a mega trench. So he did a huge trench, 100 plus meters long and 9 meters deep. 
And especially for a normal fault, you might want to do that because if every time there's an earthquake and it goes down two meters, one earthquake, two meters, another, two meters, another, two meters, another, it needs to go at least eight meters deep to get four earthquakes. So you had to dig this huge trench. And of course, it's very destructive, right? It's just all, all that material is gone. And sometimes you can destroy the best record. Always have to be very careful about the siding of the trench because it's destructive. So be careful, but sometimes you have to do it. So here's some, so it is just general points. I'll show now some examples. Questions? Well, these ones I started with. So are you looking for more of a displacement study or more of a earth, a timing study? So narrow or wide? And then how deep do you want to go? And then what is the diversity of sediment? So do we see that there, we expect to have a clear record of, uh, interacting, interfingering layers that may be offset? So these criteria are the main ones. And then access, of course, are you permitted to be there? So uh, let me give some examples now, and maybe we can discuss the, what was the criteria. So I'll show examples, uh, San Andreas Fault and D and Back Arc, so strike slip from San Andreas and strike slip from Alton Tog, and then thrusting from ND and Back Arc and uh, Palmiers, and then we'll show Grassby site from Hutsuran. So uh, let's go to Alton Tog. We, we did this before, but now for another flight, some more coffee. Passport going to China. Probably need a passport. So let's see. Are we going? Yeah, here we go. So now we're going up on Dune. Okay, so Sunda system. And so if we go to China, we see these. Uh, collision of India with Eurasia and some of these strikes of faults like the Alton Tog are less lateral strikes of faults that allow this uh, collision to be accommodated in the continental interior. So this place we went to and we dug some tre a trench I'll show you um, over here even though I'm flying to this offset. So very well defined fault zone, and uh, so that we just flew to this place here, I think, and so here's the fault zone. So we chose so criteria. So what this shows is the fault zone has a positive uh, st structure, maybe it's better to see here, where there's a like a pressure ridge. So this block has popped up about a few meters, and so it causes some damming. And so it's because of this damming, it makes for some good trench sites. So here's where we dug our trench. And we dug another trench across the frontal fault here to see what was going on. It turns out that this is a little reverse fault that is along the main strike to fault zone. So you can see again how we, we mapped before we trenched. And so we made a little morphologic map of the fault zone. And then we said, okay, so this is the best place right here. So here's a view along the fault from from this area looking to the west. So these high mountains, this is a 6,000 meter high peak. This place is high. We're already about uh, 4,000 meter elevation, so it's high desert. There's the trench we dug. So you can see the scarps. You see this fault scarp here. And what we're looking at, so again, the criteria is to read the geomorphology. So the geomorphology shows uh, alluvial fan sediments coming and deposited against this ridge. So we see nice accumulation of sediments against the fault, but we still see the fault. And so we know that the sedimentation rate isn't so high that it buries everything. It's some optimal amount of sedimentation. So we spent maybe half a day just discussing, okay, where exactly do we dig? And, and so this was it. So there's a geyser who dug it. And so you see the stratigraphy, we made a good choice. When I talk about diversity of stratigraphy, this is what I mean, is it's really nice, the interbedded gravels and reworked sand, this uh, windblown material. So so this is consistent with the, the geomorphology. So we see these sandy areas and then the gravels, right? So you always want to relate that the 
geomorphology will tell you what the stratigraphy is going to look like. So here, then, and then we see, okay, it's a very nice complex fault zone with uh, ruptures coming to the surface, but some ruptures that are deeper, and uh, the, we could use them to determine the timing of paleo earthquakes. So I won't go into the interpretation now, but in two or three days when we come to the technology of strike slip, we'll come back and discuss what we saw. But this is the trench and its setting. Because the dam is the fault also, but because it has a, you know, here you see good sedimentation, it's also downstream more from the fan, so it should be finer grained material, but still not so fine. So we have some nice you know, pebbles. So this is really good. And what I like about it is this, when I say diversity of stratigraphy, I mean or you know, species diversity. So different small environmental uh, types manifest by the sediment type. So gravel and silt alternating. You can really see the disruption there. Right? It's all gravel you can't see very well. If it's all silt you can't see very well. Let's look at another one. So this is Hill Alton Talk Falls about um, 500 kilometers east. So same fault system. And so here again, you see our, our mapping. We have this trench site on this lake. And so the lake is dammed against the fault scarp. And so here we, we took, a, so our trench we could see in Google Earth actually, which was interesting. And so you can see the fault zone marks coming in and so here we flew a balloon or actually a kite we didn't have helium very windy there so we lifted the camera and so the important thing to see was the the strand line means the edge of the lake where the wind blew some floating organic material and then also there's this alluvial fan material so again we see this really nice interfingering of the sediment, so it makes for good diversity. So here's the site, and let me see. Ah, I don't really have a picture of the, the walls, but we could see in, and I'll, I can show this in the, in the future lecture, but very nice layering was evident. But then in this case, there were one, two, three, four, five fault zones. And if you look at the topography, you could be like, oh yeah, so here's one fault zone another fault zone at the back, and then two more we can't really see in the geomorphology, but they're in the trench. So another setting. So we see just, you know, that very delicate balance between enough sedimentation to bury, but not too much that we can't find the fault. Okay, so now let's go to, to uh, thrust fault here, main Pamir thrust. So this place is, uh, so this thrust system here, this, this mountain is called Peak Lenin, the uh, fifth, fourth highest peak in Soviet Union, former times, and this is about 3,000 meters here, so big relief. And right at the mountain front is this active thrust fault, and you see we did this mapping. Again, we always do our mapping first, so this is uh, more quaternary geologic mapping, so mapping emphasizing the young uh, geology, especially in this case, some glacial units coming through and across the fault zone, and then also fluvial units, fluvial terraces. And so here we dug a trench right in the thrust fault scarp, and here you see the the the, the trend of the, the thrust coming through and lifting these sediments up and over the old top of the fluvial terrace. So here, uh, the gravels are evident, showing they're fluvial gravels, and they're, they're being thrust up and over. But this more wet zone is the, the sort of sandy and silty top of this surface where the grass is. And every time there's earthquake, it gets pushed up and over, pushing out, pushing out. So this is a kind of a site for reverse faulting. So just... Uh, I'm just going quickly through these to show some examples, but any questions on this? Uh, triangular facet? No, it's a, this is the active fault right here at the base of the topography. 
But this is an old fault that's maybe um, 500,000 years old, and the the mountain front was there before, and then, so here is the, that older thrust right there. And then in about the last 500,000 years, the frontal thrust stepped out, and it lifts. This used to be the alluvial fan, and it was the foot wall, and now it's uplifted alluvial fan hanging wall. So it's basin propagation of the thrust. Possible, but not, not, it, you can see it, but most likely it's normal fault. That's the easiest because, the, you know, you basically take the ridge and you offset like this, and so you just make the triangular path here. Whereas usually when you're thrusting, the, the mountain front is breaking and, and also that can, a lot of times the, the reverse fault can, uh, flatten and so it causes extension of that hanging wall and it breaks apart and so it won't make as good of a, no, this one's, no, this one's too hard. It was too hard to deal with because you could appear or in Altentog, so too remote. Uh, so Altentog we dug by hand. This one we brought a machine, but it took 24 hours. It's a long time with the operator. No, we did not. I have not done very much to Yeah, because here it's pretty evident, there was no doubt, but sometimes geophysics is better used when you have some uncertainty. If we could have, we would have, but logistics were too difficult. So in this place, we trenched um, right here is where the trench is. So you can see this little brown spot, so we're actually trenching a, a slightly lower terrace, so the yellow is the higher terrace cut down so this this terrace here is uh, younger. So let's now we go to the San Andreas Fault, just some more strategies. So this place is called the Dart and uh, I worked there for a long time but also uh, a woman named Lisa Grant and Carrie C they worked there before. So Grant and C they made uh, this geomorphic sketch map of the site, so fault comes in, steps over, leaves, and there's a, a shutter ridge here, some kind of a positive feature along the fault zone that's doing some damming. You see some alignment of features indicating the, the fault trace. But basically, this is a good site because it's an alluvial fan, some shifting of deposition over time, and so, there, but there's also two channels that are cut into it that are offset. So here's all the trenches we dug in four years is yellow. And then the white ones were dug by Lisa Grant in for her PhD. And so you can see the kinds of trenches that we dug. There's usually fault parallel and fault perpendicular. So fault perpendicular locates the faults and often is good for earthquake timing. The fault parallel gives us some sense of the geometry of incoming stream channels. In this case, for strike foot fault, we want to look at possibly offset. So that's the purpose here. This big site here was where we did a lot of our uh, studies for earthquake timing. And then this one was looking for offsets, offset features, or looking for stream channels coming in that then we could track. And then these over here fault parallel here and here were across these stream channels to try to understand a little bit of their timing when they cut down because we can see the offset pretty well, but, we, what, but the timing, we may want to know what the age of incision is. So here is the same place two years. So you see in 2007, we had a, uh, and this is from my balloon, helium balloon picture. So you see this excavation. We had one fault parallel trench, and then these are our trenches that are cut first wide, maybe almost 10 meters wide, and then in the middle, he cut a deeper trench right here. So it's called a bench geometry, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow. So then in 2008, this area was covered already, so you see the filling, and then here's that new long trench we used to try to find uh, features that may be offset and crossing the fault. Here's then a, a view nearby of the these trenches that we dug across these streams to try to understand the 
the uh, sedimentary and stratigraphic behavior of the stream channels that they're being offset. This picture shows one trench and then another trench for, taken from about right here, looking at these two. And so you can see this one comment is for safety. You start to see these features here. These are hydraulic shores. So they're, they're, uh, you pump them up and they're basically pressurized jacks that push against the wall every two meters for safety to hold the trench open. So these trenches are uh, three or four meters deep. And so without this shoring, they can be very unsafe. So we always use these shores every two meters. Shore is the name, or hydraulic shore, hydraulic jack. Okay, so any questions about San Andreas? This also shows the evolution of a site. So we may work there for many years, and we're slowly building our understanding by multiple cut, okay? So then how about this one? So now let's go to uh, another thrust fault system. This is the uh, Andean back arc. So subduction zone is, is here. The main arc with uplifted plateau, the altiplano, but on the back side is fold and thrust belt. So this work, I worked with uh, other colleagues, but this colleague, Ben Brooks, he was doing GPS across the back arc. And so here's the, the GPS vectors. And as you see, they come to this back arc and they're, they're pretty long, but once you cross the back arc, they get smaller. And so what he inferred or we inferred in this paper, so this is the trench perpendicular velocity across the back arc, so the east side of the system, there's about almost seven millimeters a year of strain accumulation. And so we think it's a locked big mega thrust, but in the, in the back arc. And so with these, this geometry, so it's using Coulomb type approach, dislocation model to fit the displacement field, and he was trying to show that it could be as much as 10 meters of slip uh, with the length of the rupture as well as the depth could be 8.8 .8 every thousand years. So huge earthquakes in the back arc, so far never seen before. So we wrote a proposal to study them. So now this, this is north is to the right, and this is 50 kilometers. So this is the, the fault zone just to show where this, that's this, this zone here, but now rotated for the figure. And along the zone, we could see, a, you know, the, the thrust fault was uncertain, but looking closely, we could see it. And even in here, this shows five kilometers, in SRTM hill shape, so 90 meter digital elevation model, we could see these 10 meter high fault scarps. So we went to the field, and one thing we did was we rented a small airplane, and we flew from the city, Santa Cruz, all the way along the mountain front for four or five hours. So small plane like this one, and almost getting a little bit sick, but lots of pictures. Low altitude, just documenting what does the landscape look like along the mountain front, and we started to see, oh yeah, you can really see, it looks like these are thrust fault scarps along the zone. So we went to a few, so I'll show one. This is these fields, and here was a, was a big fault scarp, it's about 10 meters tall, and here's where we proposed to dig a trench. We didn't get funded, so we didn't dig yet, but this is where we would work. Also here, so in terms of criteria, what we're looking at is here's a river channel, and so we're on the terrace next to the river channel because if we're in the active channel, it could cause problems or there could be erosion. But here on the side, we have, maybe we can date this terrace and so we could get an age and then total offset to get a short-term slip rate. And then in detail, right in the relationships on the front of the scarf, we would look for a sequence of, of unconformities, maybe showing repeating earthquakes. And our idea was 10 meters so in this per earthquake, so maybe this is all one earthquake, so it's a huge fault scarp. And we build this idea off of what is seen on the Himalayan front. So in India, Nepal, uh, there's been work done suggesting that some of these fault scarps show 10, 
or 15 meters per slip event. So magnitude 8 thrust fault seeing earthquakes on the Himalayan main frontal thrust. And so we wondered, is this an analogy for this place? So here's another one. They're flying in the plane. And you see this vegetation is quite thick, but you see a scarf. So we saw this river. And so we said, oh, we have to go there. And so we navigated. Afterwards, we drove down this place called Karandaiti. And here's the bedrock with many bedding parallel faults. But what was really important to, to me to see was this tertiary sandstone over unconsolidated sands and gravel by about six meters. So the bedrock pushed over the, the gravel. So the river bottom was, was here before probably. And there was an earthquake or a few earthquakes that pushed the tertiary sands over the, the sands and gravel. So indicating that it's probably quite a young zone. And so our idea would be to excavate more here and clean this up to better uh, understand what we're seeing. So let's see what else we have. Oh, okay, now Java. Maybe something more familiar. So uh, Gayatri, when she was working last year, working in East Java, we we started to find this Pasaran fault zone was quite interesting. So she did some, of course, the geomorphic mapping. And then right in this area was a, a, a nice step over in the strike foot fault zone. So it looks like, I'm not sorry, normal fault zone. So it looks like this two initial on fault traces. And this was a place she could get access to because the, the army was there and they controlled the land and they were uh, cooperative. And so we said, so if you look, she dug across this entire step over. So there's one fault trace there. She came across, small step, comes all the way through. Because, so the criteria here was, is, is, uh, it's a co more complex geometry, so if we want just vertical offset, maybe it's not the best site. It's not a displacement site, but it's a good event site because there's two faults. And so if an earthquake comes, you should expect a lot of fracturing across the zone. So she made this trench, um, and you see how long. Look how long this thing is. It's amazing. But this way she can see what's there, you know. So she, so here's the... She did two trenches across the zone. Here's the one fault trace coming in, and here's the other fault trace leaving. So it's this narrow step over right in the strike in normal fault system, narrow step over in a normal fault system. The fault dipped to the north. And so here's the overall, this is a, you see it's exaggerated, but uh, almost 100 meters long. So she sees the fracturing in the basin sediments. And as you go toward the basin, you see more and more accumulation, as we would expect. And then, you know, some interesting relationships like this one here, suggesting some maybe abrupt vertical offset. And then some unfaulted material. And so that's a, a good relationship then for possible earthquake timing. And so we we'll, we can go, when we talk about normal faulting, paleoseismology, in a few days we can come back to discuss the interpretation. But here you see also, and we'll talk a little bit starting tomorrow about what you do with the trench. So you, see, you see she made a really beautiful photo mosaic, and all the mapping from the trench relationships are on the photo mosaic. So these are the detailed observations, and then this is the summary. A simplified version of more complex observations. And so what she's inferring is that maybe these are the older faults here and the younger uh, portion of the trench is here with the younger active fault. And so here you just see the, the, the activity. So she was able to get a track hoe in there and did the track hoe was digging fine, right? No problem. And you see here they're cleaning to prepare the the trench. So you see on the left side is the the initial characteristic of the wall. So the the digger is cutting and the, it leaves a rough wall, but the geologists need a clean wall, so they're cleaning this side and then they'll clean the other side. There's some 
UGM students working hard. And there's Henry and some students, right? And you see they're progressively putting the grid on. So this I'll talk about more in the next lectures, but once we have the trench dug, we have to prepare it to make observations. So also, so you see another view. Now they're logging, and you see this long trench. So up here, they're in the rock. They're in the old footwall rocks, and then you see they go down the scarp. You can tell already there's different materials just by the color of the material coming out of the trench, right? So darker brown here in the maybe younger, more recent sedimentation zone, and then these, this is basically like a basalt, right? Volcanic classic sandstone, right? Yeah. And so here also some surveying of the site to document the geometry of the, the trenches and also the topography. So that's the end of this lecture. Just these examples I provided. They, we could go for a long time, but hopefully you get a sense of, you know, this mapping and understanding the geomorphology, guiding the trench, uh, positioning and um, and then some consideration of, of what kind of trenches to dig. Okay, so we will discuss more, but the main way is you can see the, the unconformities at different levels. So, for example, you see this fracturing and deformation of blue is overlain by brown. So this is an earthquake evidence. But if you go over here, you say that brown is broken, but then covered by green. So there's a second earthquake. It can't be the same as this one. It shouldn't be because this one's older than brown and this one's younger than brown. So there's two earthquakes. Then if we come this way, we can see, hmm, maybe this gray is, you know, it's well, it's below blue. Yeah. So there would be a third earthquake because this earthquake, it broke up, but it didn't break through to blue. So then blue was deposited, but then blue broke, but then brown was deposited, and then brown broke, and then green was deposited. There's three. And then down deep, it looks like there's a fourth one here that is capped by in, within the yellow. So so it's, I would say this is still work in progress, just, uh, but the after all the description, this is the geologic history of the trench and what we're looking for is these unconformities. Well, as I was saying before, well, as I was saying before, all we can say is at a point, and you can see here, so this is highly exaggerated, this is 18 meters, so, uh, what is this about? One meter maybe? 50 centimeters? 20 centimeters. So these are small vertical offsets. Here, here, here. So, overall, it seems consistent with smaller earthquakes, but it's just one point on the fault. And so, if you remember.